Well, it's a dream to idolize someone and then ultimately get the opportunity to meet and develop a personal rapport with them. Monish Prabhai was one of the few who had a strong bond with the late Charlie Munger, who passed away last week. Well, thanks a lot, Monish, for joining in on the show to give us an insight into this very, very special bond you had with Mr. Munger. First up, tell us, how did this relationship start? Well, the relationship started actually in 2009, about uh, 14 years ago, and it was Warren Buffett who introduced uh, us to Charlie. And I had I had met Warren in 2008 because I'd bid for the charity lunch he has every year, and we won that that year. And uh, and so he he uh, set us up to meet uh, Charlie for lunch, and I I had just expected that uh, we would have lunch with Charlie, and that'd be the end of that. But uh, it ended up that uh, that lunch led to a very nice, warm relationship with Charlie. I became a bridge partner of his. Uh, used to, we used to play bridge on Fridays at the LA Country Club, probably around like four hours in the afternoon and then uh, an hour for lunch before that. And a lot of banter about all kinds of subjects. And usually uh, every probably two or three months, Charlie had us come over for dinner to his place in LA. And uh, so we had very uh, wonderful evenings uh, with him. In fact, my my last my last one-on-one -on -one dinner with Charlie was exactly a month before he passed away. And uh, it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful evening and very engaged and it was great. I can see in your backdrop, you know, what they meant to you in terms of learnings, in terms of this relationship as well. Tell us more about that. Uh, you know, how did, it, how did it dwell up in the first place? And what were the key learnings, maybe about life, and then we could get to markets as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Charlie, uh, you know, Charlie probably more than Warren uh, is able to read people really well and really fast. Uh, and I think for uh, whatever reason, uh, I passed through his filters. And uh, actually, many times when he would describe me to friends of his and so on, and I would get some of those kind of comments back, it was very accurate in terms of how he saw me. And uh, so it was really surprising that really quickly he was able to uh, figure out uh, a lot of things about me and uh, had a keen interest in uh, interacting and I would say that both with Buffett and Munger, there's a lot in the public domain. We don't need to know them to learn from them. I think there's a lot we can uh, learn from just with all the writings and videos and, and all of that. But I would say with Charlie, uh, I, learned, uh, I learned a lot, not so much from what he said to me, even though there were many fascinating conversations, I, I learned from observing him. So he has eight kids. He has a lot of in-laws, a lot of grandkids, even some great grandkids. I had a lot of interaction with uh, a lot of the family. And you know, the family is a spectrum, right? So there's people who are, uh, there are all kinds of people in that, in that group. And uh, I saw that Charlie was able to finesse great relationships with all of them. And some of them I found, you know, a bit odd or strange or something. And sometimes I would bring that up with Charlie. <laughs> And uh, he would say, yeah, you know, I know, but, you know, uh, that's just life as we roll with it. And uh, so I, I saw the way he finessed these relationships. I saw the way he was able to figure out different businesses and business leaders. Uh, he had a very deep love for Costco. You know, we don't have Costco in India yet. Uh, they just entered China. Probably at some point they'll enter India. And probably at almost every dinner we had, probably at least 20, 30 minutes, uh, would be some uh, nuance of Costco that would come up. And uh, mm -hmm. it was a great business, and uh, Charlie was a director for many decades. Uh, so there was a lot of learning there. Um, in our last meeting, uh, we actually discussed uh, some stocks, and uh, so uh, we, had a, we had a great discussion about some uh, recent U.S. positions I had taken, and uh, just very engaged. And, and last several meetings, he would always complain that uh, Berkshire has all this cash, you know, they have a 157 billion uh, in cash, all time record. And uh, they're not able to find much, you know, the company is making 30, 40 billion a year. 
And so he'd always moan and groan saying, you know, we have all this cash and we can't find opportunities. And, and I said, you know, Charlie, you guys always had that problem, but you somehow or the other, every few years find some great deal. So I'm sure uh, something will come along. So uh, we, we had a lot of discussions about, uh, you know, people, psychology, uh, different books. Um, mm. And uh, sometimes I had personal issues, personal problems, and uh, I brought those to Charlie, and really, it was quite spectacular. So he was, um, he was a very broad, uh, broad-based human, very broad-based thinker. Probably the smartest person I've met. But the high IQ was coupled with a person who was maybe reading something like a couple of hundred books a year, for maybe six, seven, eight decades. So. And the ability in his brain, the way he filed things away to kind of correlate different mental models. Uh, Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I'll bring up some issue with Dakshana. And before I finished the sentence, he's never been to India. He'd always already kind of solved the issue, you know? So uh, just the speed of the way his brain processed was amazing to watch. Well, and 100 books a year, you know, that's telling you his will to learn as well at every stage. Manish, you have interacted with both of them, right? Charlie as well as Warren. They had a couple of healthy disagreements as well, maybe on the market. Uh, Tell us a couple of those instances, you know, if any, when both of them were not on the same page, two very, very bright minds, but uh, some friendly banter, maybe a, a debate that you could recollect. Yeah, Warren and Charlie said that they disagreed uh, many times over the last... Yeah. Uh, you know, 60, 70 years of their friendship, but they never had an argument. Uh, it was a very good relationship. And, uh, you know, the big change uh, Charlie caused in Warren was that Warren was a very diehard Ben Graham guy wanting to buy um, cheap uh, cheap assets, you know, even if the quality wasn't that great. He was very focused on price. And Charlie convinced him that it was it was better to buy a great business at a fair price than a fair business at a great price. And this was a big transformation, a big moment for Warren. And uh, the first time that happened was in 1972 when they bought C's Candy. And uh, so they paid, you know, multiples of book value for that. It was a great business. They paid about 25 million for it. And they've already collected since then about two and a half billion in uh, dividends from the company. Uh, The C's purchase uh, led them to the Coke purchase. Uh, so Coke is a very large position for them. And in the late 80s, when they bought Coca-Cola, they put a quarter of the book value of Berkshire Hathaway uh, into Coke. And uh, and they've continued from then, you know, even the Apple purchase now. Uh, so basically, this transition was a very important transition. But there were many transitions that Warren made that would not have happened without Charlie. So if you take Charlie out of the picture, the market cap, cap of Berkshire Hathaway, I would say, might be one hundredth of what it is today. So it's about, it's not a seven hundred billion. It might be less than ten billion. Uh, so Warren would have been successful, but nothing like what happened. Uh, he also convinced Warren that once they bought a business, they should not and could not sell it because that would have an impact on future sellers. So sellers of businesses know that when they sell to Berkshire, it's a permanent deal. The business Mm -hmm. is not going to be shopped to private equity or resold or any of that. So that leads them to get deals that nobody else sees. I love this one, where Charlie said, there are three ways that a smart person can go broke. Liquor, ladies, and leverage. What were your key learnings, you know, from the interactions you had with them? Well, one of the, you know, so I think I think when you look at Charlie Munger at the Berkshire meeting or the other kind of public settings, uh, you kind of uh, get a persona, which is kind of like a wisecrack, you know, someone who kind of has these zingers and one-liners and so on. And uh, when I interacted with Charlie one-on-one, uh, what I found is that uh, out you know, inside that cold exterior uh, was a very, very warm person. Same with Warren. And I think both of them had this hard exterior because they have to protect themselves. You know, they're, uh, they're you know, in the world and so on. But once you get past that exterior, uh, very warm, 
kind soul uh, and someone with a, a very high degree of empathy. So basically, uh, he was extremely good at investing. He was great at architecture. He was really good at understanding humans. He was for interested in the humans. Like he would, he would ask me a lot of questions about the Dakshina scholars, about the female scholars we had and kind of their life trajectory. Just very engaged on a human level. So almost till the end, he traveled by coach, you know. So Berkshire Hathaway owns NetJets, which is a uh, fractional jet ownership, you know, private jets. But uh, Charlie liked to travel uh, by coach uh, economy. And he did that because he said he did not want to lose a common touch. He wanted to keep interacting with Joe Public, you know. So sometimes he would go for a Costco board meeting. He'd be on a Southwest Airlines flight, back with a plane, middle seat. He's a big guy, squished in. He had a book with him. He really didn't care. It was irrelevant. And he would take an interest in the people on both sides. In many ways, he was a modern Ben Franklin. I think the closest person uh, to Charlie was Ben Franklin. And the United States, um, mm -hmm. you know, out of all the founding fathers, the United States actually would not exist if Ben Franklin mm -hmm. did not exist. So he had a mm -hmm. huge impact on the formation of the country and a uh, very unusual guy. And there were a lot of similarities between Charlie and Ben Franklin. Well, Monish, you mentioned, you know, at Dakshina Foundation as well, uh, you've had a hall that's named after Mr. Munger. Tell us the backstory on that. Yeah, we have the Charles T. Munger Hall in, uh, in Bengaluru. It's near the airport. So if your uh, listeners anytime want to go visit it, I think you'll have a great time. Uh, I think uh, maybe it was 2013 or something where I wrote to Charlie saying that, look, we are want to name this hall after him. And uh, I just wanted to not, I didn't want to do it without him giving an okay. So he said, well, it's a strange request and kind of bizarre. You know, he never wanted his name in lights. He wasn't an ego guy or anything. Uh, but he said, you, you, you can go ahead. And he says, uh, something good might come of it. And, uh, and actually the, the kids there played a wonderful tribute to him uh, on the day he died. And I always get questions uh, when I interact with the Dakshina kids, who is Charlie Munger? And it, it provokes a great conversation. It helps them learn more about him. And I think anything uh, I can do to help people learn or know about Charlie is going to improve their lives. So it's been, it's been wonderful to have that. Well, time to slip into a short break. We'll be back in a flash and we'll continue this conversation with Mr. Pabrai. Welcome back. Well, you're tuned into this exclusive conversation we are having with Mr. Monish Pabrai on Mr. Charlie Munger's journey. But in terms of investment philosophy, you know, what was the best takeaway that you got from Mr. Munger, yeah. some kind of investment advice that you got from him? Basically, he uh, was a big advocate of uh, swinging for the fences when you had all the odds in your favor. Uh, he wanted few bets big bets, infrequent bets. So I really learned the value of concentration from Charlie. Uh, Charlie always said that it was very rare to find great investment ideas. Uh, maybe in a lifetime, if we are lucky, we may have a half a dozen uh, truly great investment ideas, maybe one every five years or 10 years. And when we get one of those ideas and you know it hits us uh, on the head with like a two by four, uh, basically, you go all in, and so uh, this the and and you know investing is a business with a high error rate. Uh, the best of us are going to be long, wrong half the time, but uh, you know something that is even a ten or fifteen percent position could end up being a fifty bagger, hundred bagger, and so you know it doesn't matter what's in the rest of the portfolio if you just hold on. And so those were some of the important lessons, uh, you know, basically uh, spend the time to understand the business extremely well, uh, make sure you're within your circle competence, uh, yeah. and then uh, don't be shy. Right. You know, Monish, I've seen you take some big bets here in India, and you hold on to those positions as well. I think part of that could be inspired by the learnings from Mr. Munger. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I think if we are going to make an investment, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're making it for the long haul. We're not trying to figure out what happens next week or next month or next quarter. And uh, so, uh, you know, you know, those types of uh, investments, you know, we might not see the returns for a few years or sometimes we get lucky and uh, the valuations, you know, uh, reflect that in a six months or a year. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, we want to not be thinking about buying stocks. What we are buying is fractional interests in businesses. And basically, when we are buying these businesses, the first question we should ask is, how much can I buy the whole business for? You know, uh, sometimes people will say, hey, you know, Apple's at 150, uh, should I buy it? And I'll ask the person, well, what's the market cap of Apple? And they have no idea what it is. I said, well, you know, so the first question when you're trying to buy a business is what can you buy the whole business for? And then the second question is that if, if you're interested in buying the business, would you be comfortable putting one third of your family's entire assets? And let's assume you had, you know, hundreds of crores or thousands of crores. Would you be willing to put a third of that to buy the entire company? And mm -hmm. if the answer is no, then you shouldn't even buy one share. So it's the mindset of ownership uh, over the long haul that really comes through from Charlie. Mm. Anish, what about his view on cryptocurrency? Now, that was quite famous, right? Uh, crypto, in, depending on when you got in, did quite well. But when you all chatted, what was his view out there? Yeah, I don't think I don't think we ever spent time on crypto because him and he, he and I have very similar perspectives on it. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't I don't think I mean I think that in the end um, most people who participate in that space uh, will have a negative return. Uh, it will not be a pleasant experience. And uh, you know the euphoria can go on for a while. Bubbles can go on for a while. So uh, we've al already had a lot of turmoil in that space, but. The way I look at it is that, you know, both Charlie and Warren uh, talked about what they call the too hard pile. So there are some uh, investment decisions that are easy and within our circle of competence. And a large number of things that we encounter are either businesses or uh, investments we don't understand, or, uh, you know, they, we just scratch our head. So from my point of view, uh, I'm not long crypto. I'm not short crypto. I don't care what happens to crypto. Uh, <laughs> it's really irrelevant, you know. So uh, my focus is on the businesses that I do have an interest in, that we do have money invested in, and and so on. So there are lots and lots of uh, areas of the market mm. that I would be completely incompetent on, and that's perfectly fine. All right. But uh, one place where, in fact, you definitely have put a lot of money on the table would be equities. What's your view on the global equity setup? Because, you know, this year has been a rather good year, actually. For global equities, how do you see things panning out? Are there signs of euphoria out there? You know, you're a value investor, so you'd be seeing pockets of value. Where do you see those pockets? Yeah, I think that, uh, and I had a lot of discussions with Charlie on this in the last few years, is I, I have, uh, you know, in more than a quarter century of investing, uh, I have the most bizarre portfolio one can imagine today. So about uh, half the money, uh, close to 40, 50% is invested in Turkey in three stocks. Uh, another 25% or so is invested in the coal industry in the United States. And uh, and we have a little bit in India. And, uh, and basically, um, I think that... Uh, I've never had this kind of a unusual concentration, but I also feel uh, with what we own that basically don't need to do much for a while. So I find in general, uh, the US markets, which is where I spend the most time, to be either fully priced or overpriced. Uh, definitely the top six or seven uh, market caps um, are either fully priced or overpriced. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the rest of the market, uh, also doesn't seem that attractive. I mean, you know, we had a huge change in interest rates, which would normally lead to a huge drop in equity valuations. We never saw that. Uh, mm -hmm. When I look at India, I see a lot of growth ahead. I think India is a tremendous growth story. But you have to overlay that with a market where there's a lot of 
brain power, very smart investors, mm. and a lot of euphoria because uh, the company which have spectacular futures ahead of them and the ones that have great corporate governance is a relatively small list. And mm. uh, everyone piles into those, you know, and so, um, it's not a problem to identify great businesses in India. Uh, I find that it is a problem to find them at attractive valuations. I think the area that in India that might be very fertile uh, might be small caps and mid caps, but one would really need to be in the country all the time and you know pouring over those uh, you know one business at a time and kicking the tire. So um, I don't see as much opportunity amongst the larger uh, Indian businesses, but I do believe that India, India Inc. Uh, will do extremely well. Well, uh, Monish, you know, we are thumping the table. We believe that there are a lot of, uh, you know, broader market stocks that could do well. And if India Inc. is going to do well, will you probably look at increasing some allocation? Because as of now, I th as you said, U.S. coal as well as Turkey, bulk of the money is invested out there. Is there a possibility that India gets a larger bite in 2024, 2025? Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, if we found one, uh, one business uh, in India that looked attractive, you know, we would put a lot of money against it, assuming it was large enough to, to absorb it. So we don't need a lot of ideas. And basically, it's, it's just a matter of uh, finding something that's within my circle of competence, which has great, great governance, has high returns on equity, uh, strong mm. tailwinds. And yeah, absolutely. We, I think that uh, the India growth story, I think, is very unique in yeah. the whole world. One of the only places in the world which has a large population and a growing population um, and a very strong entrepreneurial culture, a very pro-business government culture. So... I think there's a lot to like about India. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Monish, we appreciate you joining in here on CNBC TV 18. Thanks a lot for taking time out, running us through your relationship with Mr. Mangam, and also giving us your brief insights into global markets. Nigel, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.